All right, latest guest on Double OT is ESPN's Mike Reese. You've been covering the Patriots for, what, two decades now? Started in 1997, Yanni. I'm getting old. You, you lasted the entire Tom Brady era. You go hmm. back to Pete Carroll. So you weren't there for the Parcells in 96? I was in the stands as a fan. <laughs> one of the first games. One of the first games. I mean, I'll, one of my favorite memories as a Patriots fan, 1994 against the Vikings, you know, 20, 20 to nothing in the second yep. quarter. Bledsoe threw it 70 times that game. I was in the stands. I remember high-fiving my buddy. Wow. That's one of my favorite memories. So you're, and before we get into everything, you're of the mindset sort of like me growing up a Patriot fan. Like, you were a fan during the Bledsoe time. So whereas your relationship with Tom Brady was through work, your first relationship with Bledsoe was more as a fan. So I always tell, uh, I always tell people I work with in interns that I'm like, I'm more interested or fanboyish over people that played when I was a fan, when I was a kid, than people who are playing now. Does that make sense to you? Totally makes sense. And so for me, like the Bledsoe thing, I was, that was a freshman year of college for me. And they had the number one pick. And it's like, will it be Drew Bledsoe or Rick Meyer? You know, uh, Bill Parcells would become the coach. And so, like, that alone was exciting, right? And then they go Bledsoe, and, and it was like, there's hope. And so, like, it was like, we got our guy, our franchise quarterback. And the greatest part, Yanni, about this is that, as it turns out, like, Bledsoe was a great player, obviously, in that time and sort of brought the Patriots to relevancy along with Parcells mm -hmm. and then uh, Robert Kraft buying the team. But like he's a he he might be the greatest person, you know. Like getting to know him after the fact. Um, and in fact, last summer we were in Israel together on a trip uh, with the Patriots, and I, I just I saw a side of him that I had never seen before, and my respect for him only grew that much right. greater because of that. Yeah, we caught up with him at a golf tournament afterwards, and he was on that trip with you, and I know Vince Wilfork, and uh, they had unbelievable stories from that trip. That's really cool that uh, you get to go on that. So we haven't spoken, um, well, probably since uh, that Tennessee playoff game, and uh, actually you came to my URI class after that, uh, so that was probably in March. So if I told you that uh, – There'd be a season that we don't know what's going to happen. And Tom Brady is the Patriots quarterback. Obviously, a lot has changed since then. Um, how wild has the last few months been with where we are with the NFL and with the Patriots at quarterback? So wild. You know, the Brady stuff, I will say, looking back on it, you know, uh, I didn't think that's the way it was going to go. Mm -hmm. I really thought ultimately both he and Bill Belichick would sort of come to the thought process of like, this is the best place for both of us so that actually went in a, di a different direction than I was expecting and then talk about different directions Yanni I mean where we are in the country and with everything going on could have never forecast that so um, you know though I would say how wild is it I mean yeah. beyond our wildest imagination and so much consistency with the Patriots I, I want to get into some media stuff as we chat here um, are you excited for this new time in your career where it's the Patriots are projected to be, I guess, an average team or a borderline playoff team? And we always joke around these parts that the season didn't start to the divisional round of the playoffs. That certainly won't be the case this year. Are you looking forward to the new challenge or I guess the change of covering a team that's not projected to go to the Super Bowl? Well, I would say I am now. You know, when it all happened with Tom Brady, there was a part of me, honestly, that thought this is not the way it was supposed to end, mm -hmm. you know, for him and for the franchise, that he was supposed to be a one uniform player. Right. And right. so I, I felt that even covering the team where you have a disconnect to what's going on, you know, I, how can you not have some emotion, right? You've been doing this for two decades, you know, and so that there was a process to go from that point to where I am now, which is excited, energized, and really feeling that this is gonna be one of the most compelling Patriot seasons in recent memory. You know, you mentioned not supposed to be a Super Bowl contender, like, well, who knows? Like, what were they saying in 2001? Mm -hmm. Were they saying at the start of that year, the Patriots are a Super Bowl contender? 
No, but they ended up last year. I'll just use this as an example. How many people at this time are saying the Tennessee Titans would be in the AFC championship game? Right there, Yanni, a zero. I'll, I'll point it out for you with my small hands right there. So that, to me, is the essence of sports. It's like, well, we don't know what's going to happen. We can predict it, but it's about competition, putting a team together. What does it look like? Is Stidham the next guy? Like, if you can't get excited about that and think that that's compelling, like, we're in the wrong line of work, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so uh, you mentioned Stidham. Uh, Bill Belichick now, first year without Tom Brady since the year 2000. It's one of those cliche sports radio talk show questions, but I'll ask it to you anyway. W who has more to prove, Belichick or Brady? Yeah, pick a side, Yanni, right? Like, I don't, I don't believe you can say one or the other because to me, I, I look at it like they don't really need to prove anything to me. Right. But if I had to pick one, I guess I would say Bill Belichick. Just because, I mean, Tom's 43 years old in August. And if he goes down to Tampa and it doesn't work out, like, I think you could say, well, Father Time caught up with him. I don't know if you could really say, like, oh, he's, you know, nothing without Belichick. I mean, he's 43, he's still doing what no one has ever done before just by being on the field, you know? Whereas for Belichick, like, you look at the, the, a little bit of a larger sample size, I guess you could say, with the, the stretch he had in Cleveland where it was actually going very well. And then the, you know, when the franchise moves, I mean, the sort of bottom falls out under it. Right. So, I mean, it was going well. And then he's 13 and six without Brady with the Patriots. But I suppose like if the bottom falls out this year, which I guess you could say is possible, right? Five wins, six wins. It opens another talking point to say, well, what will 2021 look like? And if that, doesn't work out well well maybe maybe you do start to look at that a little bit differently so I guess if I had to choose one I'd say Belichick but I'm not that like you know right. not that drawn to the question yeah it's not a home run uh, answer okay so Jared Stidham are you a buyer of him as QB1 is he solidified as week one starter and what do you think his potential will be as the Patriots quarterback well, I would say that if he's not the week one starter, that things didn't go according to plan. And that, you know, you're probably back in the quarterback market in 2021 if he's not under center. That, you know, I, so they want to see it. They want to see what it looks like. But if he's not there, you know, that's probably a troubling sign, Yanni. You know, that they don't think, you know, that there's doubt there, you know, that right, he can be right. that guy. So. I think they believe there's a chance and they seen him, you know, behind the scenes a lot more than we did. And I think they deserve the benefit of our doubt, you know, that if they're giving him an endorsement that they think there's a chance for him to be the guy, like I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. Like I'll buy that. He could be the guy still has to go prove it. Right. Like we didn't know about Tom Brady for sure in 2001 until he actually got out and did it. Same situation applies here, but all the, the, the pieces line up, you know, to give him a chance to, to be that QB1. There's so many parallels to 2001. Um, I want to ask you, you know, in a lot of the books and reporting over the years, people have said that Belichick really liked Brady uh, in 2001 in the preseason, but Bel uh, Bledsoe just signed a $100 million contract. Do you think there would have been a point without the Mo Lewis hit where Brady would have supplanted Bledsoe that year? Entirely possible. You know, he, had, he was moving up the depth chart, so he was already number two. So to, if Bledsoe's performance, you know, started to slide, like, it was coming. So if Bledsoe was here mm -hmm. and Tom was here, if that yeah. performance starts to slide, like, and your team needs a spark, and Bill Belichick's in his second year coaching the team. They were 5-11 and 11 in year one. And let's say they were, let's just say, 4-10 and 10 with two weeks to go. Yeah, it's possible, right? Like when we look back to that time. So injury or not, like Tom was coming. <laughs> um, and another parallel to that year is sort of getting the salary cap right and maybe shedding some contracts and sort of resetting the roster. Uh, everyone knows the 
salary cap situation this year isn't great for the Patriots. A lot of numbers come off the books next year. Um, from that perspective, is this a transition year roster wise, or do you think the money that frees up next year is just going to allow them uh, to spend more? I think that's a fair point that, that you make there. You know, they have $26 million worth of dead cap space this year, one of the highest figures in the league. And so a lot of the moves they made were modest sort of free agent signings just to sort of build the depth, similar in a lot of ways to 2001 when they brought in, you know, guys like Vrabel and, you know, uh, mid, mid-level guys, you know, to fill it out. And that team came together real nice. It, you know, you're sort of paying the price for some of your past decisions. Tom Brady's dead cap charge, Antonio Brown, Steven Gostkowski. Like those are decisions you made to sort of keep that, last era alive and and keep adding some pieces there now you're paying that and so next year it does open up a lot more um so i think i look at it through that two-year snapshot i think that's fair that doesn't mean they can't win this year make a deep run but i would say it's positioned probably more so for 2021 and when you read some of these projections peter king who i know you respect i respect had him 21 ranked in his Monday football morning in America column behind Miami and Buffalo in the division. Uh, There was a couple head scratchers I saw ahead of new England too. NFL.com had them as one of the lowest. We know that Brady masked a lot of their issues um, from a roster. That's pretty similar to last year from strictly a roster perspective and without Brady now, where do you see the roster? Because if Stidham doesn't hit, do they have enough talent, even with the greatest coach ever, uh, to, to make a run at this thing? Well, I, I think they do. And, and part of me wonders if, if I'm just being overly optimistic. But I think it's almost a slight, Yanni, to the players in the locker room to think that just because it and, – and Tom Brady, in my opinion, like if you're asking me who's the best quarterback of all time, like I'm going to pick Tom Brady. So I don't want to like – diminish anything that he did but like this program was a lot more than just Tom Brady over the last 20 years like he's a huge part of it don't get me wrong but to to just overlook the fact that they've had a lot of talented players that are high character guys like I think is missing the point here this program's a lot bigger than just one player I feel strongly about that and so I do I think if they can get a reasonably decent level of quarterback play, which is a huge question, and that's why, that, that's why I don't even think like it's – you can put them at 21, make a case for it, put them at 10 and make a case for it to me. You know, like I think right. to me it does come down to that quarterback play. If you get a decent level of quarterback play, I think that this team can be competitive and win their fair share of games. All right, so you had a column about uh, same, better, or worse at each offensive position from a year ago. Um, Maybe give me a snapshot of that column, some of the decisions you made that stood out, um, obviously besides the quarterback, which I assume is is a drop down from Brady uh, to Stidham, but other positions. Yeah, so it was a drop down, Yanni, just to start there. I picked worse at the quarterback position. And look, I made the point that you got one of the greatest leaders in the history of sports not just football leaving like that's a huge void to fill I did also make the point though that last year you could see the frustration that Tom had at times and even it mentioned it to Al Michaels saying you know he was the most miserable 8-0 quarterback that there was and and it would be naive to overlook that some people around the team picked up on that and that that it was a a a little bit of an emotional drain at times Mm -hmm. to overcome so I think I still labeled it as worse. Maybe the one that stands out to me on his running back, you know, I, I, I called it better. They have every running back back from last season, and they added an undrafted free agent, J.J. Taylor, out of Arizona. And the reason I said better is, like, last year you got Damian Harris, a third-round pick, who averaged 6.4 yards a carry at Alabama, top program in college in the country, hardly played, you know? And so you're bringing that whole group back, with offensive line that I think is going to be better, with David Andrews coming back, better depth, better quality, you know, from top to bottom, I think those two areas is probably what I would highlight, maybe with tight end, with the investments they made in the third round, mm-hmm. with Devin Asiasi and Dalton Keene, as areas that I label as 
better than they had last year. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I guess because of the departing guys at linebacker, are you doing this uh, column for defense too? Yeah, yeah. Um, doing it at defense. Maybe a, more of a drop off on the defensive side of the ball, but the the offense minus Brady, I agree. A lot of a lot of upside at those positions. Um, now you're as we approach this coming season, what is, I know you're a planner and we're used to June as mini camp and July is training camp and September's. What are you hearing right now about what access we in the media will have? I assume there'll be no scrums where there's a player and 25 people around them or open locker room, but do you think it'll just be press conference setting or maybe just zoom calls where we'll be allowed there? What do you think ultimately happens covering this team this year? I would think a lot of video conferences is probably going to be the norm. So like, and I don't know this for sure, Yanni, but I would think like after a game, you know, instead of everyone going down to the news conference area, if we're even at the game, quite frankly, we're logging onto a Zoom call and Bill Belichick pops up and we're asking our questions that way. So I would be surprised. Yeah. If it's, if it's different than that. So you don't think it'll be an in-person press conference? Um, it, it, it possible, you know, like you might have like one camera, like a pool camera and a couple reporters in there that maybe represent mm -hmm. all right. the reporters. Like Super Bowl week, we don't have access to the practice. There's one pool reporter. Yep. Um, do you think we'll be allowed at the games? I mean, we're just guessing. My, my sense is that it would be a very limited number that would be at games, if any at all. And again, I think it's important to point out this isn't based on any concrete right, information. Right. Everything's changing very fast. But to me, this is like you can't really take enough precautions. Right. And I think this is going to be one of those years where most of it would be done the way we're talking right now versus the way it's traditionally been done. Um, so we know the Patriots still have a national brand uh, because of their incredible success. They have five primetime games. but the Bucks have more buzz with Brady and Gronkowski and, and all the buzz going on down there. I'm curious, are you not going to be on the get ups or the sports centers as much? Because last year it was Mike Reese every day, you and Greeny because is Tom leaving? Is he going? What's going on? Um, whereas a lot of that buzz has left town. So how does that affect your day to day? You're, you still cover the Patriots credibly well every day, but maybe a lighter workload for you without Brady in town? We will see. I would say this, like to me, it's a two-sided story, Yanni. As compelling as it's gonna be to see how Tom Brady does in Tampa, mm -hmm. and he's the game's biggest star, so naturally the spotlight's gonna follow him. Isn't it equally as compelling as to how the Patriots are gonna respond without him. Right. Like to me, that is on the same level. So just like we're on the split screen here, yep. I could envision our Tampa Bay reporter, Jenna Lane on that side, right. our Patriots reporter on the other side, and continuing to create that contrast of this compelling story. That's something, so our station has CBS and Fox. So we're gonna be able to show a lot of the, the Brady games. Do you anticipate, obviously ESPN's a national platform, so you're covering both anyway. Do you anticipate a Boston Globe or another outlet maybe just dedicating someone entirely to the Bucks and to Brady? Because there may be as much, maybe not as much, but a big percentage as much interest into Brady and the Bucks as there is the Patriots this year. Would you agree? I would agree. And I think it's a it's a good, really good thought, Yanni. I would say in you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, probably would be a slam dunk. Um, as we know from living in this media world, a lot has changed. Right. And many staffs are consolidating and really being careful with their budgets, understandably so. So I think the question would be like, what's the benefit based on, you know, the cost analysis sure. of doing that? But you could probably do that with someone that's already down there, you know, that you wouldn't have to travel down there, sure. you know, and, and with all the way coverage might be different this year anyway, like I would say that that's a really, really solid thought by you that that would be sort of part of the regular coverage. 
Um, I want to ask you about uh, covering the team and probably inarguably the toughest team to cover in terms of getting information, having people talk, everyone's so tight lipped in Foxborough. When you talk to people at ESPN or, or national people and they're like, Oh, you know, if I'm in new Orleans, I'm getting Drew Brees one-on-one -on -one, or big Ben one-on-one -on -one, Rogers, maybe people on the same playing field as Tom Brady. Um, how do you describe covering the Patriots when maybe the access isn't as much available to us as it is in other markets mm -hmm. well so you know the saying like you don't know what you don't know right like just, i've just covered the patriots you know so i it's hard for me to compare it to anywhere else mm -hmm. you're always going to want more access like that i think that sort of goes without saying right i i think what i what i would focus on is like okay maybe other teams give more access like I would focus more on who, the quality of the people mm -hmm. that we're talking to. So like I'll use Bill Belichick as an example, like part of the reason, like I love football and I'm like intrigued by the inner workings of it is our interactions with him mm -hmm. because he's like a professor, you know, right. a teacher of the game, like go in the locker room, Yanni. And I see you in there all the time, like over the last handful of years, like you tell me, would you say the majority of guys in that room are really good to talk to, respectful I, people? I would, and you know it's funny this off season as we're, or even the conference calls after the draft when you're talking to these people, and then the newcomers. Um, who's who's the guy who bopped around? He was a linebacker. He's uh, he um, from the Jets. Who yep, we Brandon to? Copeland. You talk Brandon to him Copeland. on these calls and you're like, oh, this is quintessential Patriot. Like right when you hear this person, you sort of get it. So absolutely, in terms of character, uh, uh, the Patriots have a mold in, in, in that way. So I would agree with that. And it's, it's so transparent God, they, how much they value character when you're talking to those guys in the locker room. And, and so the whole idea of like, I get it on the access because mm -hmm. like we'll always want more access, never, would never want to see that go away. I think my contrast to that would be like, you could give me all the access in the world, but if the people that you're talking to don't seem like decent people who represent, you know, good and, 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 you know, in, in saying that Yanni, like a lot of these guys will sort of toe the company line and sort of right. say what they've maybe been coached to say, but I, I honestly not sure how different that is from, from many other places around the league that might be might be a little overstated but again i, I don't really know for sure because i really only know you know this one team um what is your i know obviously you've gotten close to many patriots over the years i see the troy brown book behind you you of course wrote the book with troy brown what is do you have like a a process or a tactic of getting close building relationships to these players all right this guy's a first round pick I introduce myself day one, I pop over, say hi, ask about the family, don't make it all football. What is your process to building relationships with players and coaches so that while you're doing your job, they trust you, you have a relationship, and it's not one that you're maybe violating where you're always asking them for favors or for nuggets and they trust you? I, I don't know if there's like any real, you know, formula. I think it's the same thing we would tell our kids, right? And I see your videos as Michael Jordan playing in the driveway with <laughs> your kids. You. I have a fifth grader and a second grader, like, you know, treat people the way that you would want to be treated. And, and so you do that. And then in, in doing that, maybe just explaining, like, this is who I am and this is my background, this is my job, you know? And so they can, you know, just know who you are when you're asking a question. I think that's pretty, like, but don't you think that we should we should do that yeah. to our neighbors or our, you know, our people at the grocery store when we're checking? You know what I mean? Like, it's just right. a basic, just be like hu human. The tough, right? part, the tough part about our job and is we're, we're technically there to accomplish something that day. So when we do these media scrums after a game or on a Wednesday, the big availability day, we're all sticking our microphones in there and there's maybe a quick pleasantry. Hey, how are you? But then we get right to the action. Sometimes it feels like there's no time to have a normal like 
So I think it's good. I see you do this often in the locker room. You go up to someone, you have a conversation and your microphone's not on or, and you're just <laughs> have, talking like a normal person because like, how can you, it's just not a normal reaction to run up to someone while they're getting dressed after a game and start asking them a million questions. But that's just sort of what we do. That's the process of it all. So I always tell people well, like, obviously you, you have a better relationship with most of these guys than I do, but like someone would be like, Oh, would so-and-so know who you are? And I'm like, well, they'd recognize my face, but they don't really probably not even know my name or like anything about me just because our relationship is purely business it's like i'm asking you a quick question we're not like shooting the breeze after the day yeah one of my favorite stories Jenny. so my best friend in the world is my college roommate from uh, university of massachusetts in 1994 mm -hmm. and he was a professional baseball player wow. and in the minor leagues and he would tell me we would talk like huh, you're the media you know, and he's the athlete. He would say, the thing that I can't stand about you guys, you know, is you'd walk by me in the clubhouse for like two weeks. You might not even acknowledge me, you know? And then like, you know, I either make a big error, you know, to cost us a game, or maybe I'm fortunate enough to get the hit that scores yeah. the winning run. And now you come running up to me and you want to talk to me. Like, like, we're, who are you? Like, who do you think you are? And I, I've never forgot him saying that right. because honestly, like, like he's got a point. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like if it feels so transactional all the time, that's the word like, I was looking for. Transactional. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so maybe if, and, and I think this is, this goes well beyond the locker room, Yanni. And I think in light of world events, like mm -hmm. we could probably go on and on about this. Like, it's just like connecting on a human level, which we should do that whether we're in the locker room, whether it's you and me talking or the URI campus with our neighbors, you know, all that. Uh, just a couple more here. Um, going into this year, what is, what is, a, I don't know, I want to say a hot take or a big prediction, but what is like the one thing that you think is going to happen that a lot of people aren't talking about or something that's a little bit under the radar going into this year? Specific to the Patriots? Yes. All right. Um, let's see. I think Stidham's going to be, a, uh, I think Stidham's going to play, play well. You know, like I think there's obviously an element to the unknown, but I think he's going to give him a quality level of play. I think the coaching here is real, really strong. And it's really, I think it could really shine this year. So I think like, you know, I think when you're in certain teams, like every coaching staff has given you the tools, you know, for you to get out and go play. I think the toolbox in New England is sort of like, like the Cadillac of toolboxes. Yeah. Like there's, there, you know, there's almost yeah. a part of me, Yanni, that, that said if they had to turn to Brian Hoyer, which I don't think would be the ideal scenario based on the way they've drawn it up, like I wouldn't be shocked if they're competitive and win games with him too because of the coaching, you know? But I, I would – you asked me what one thing. I think if I had to invest in something, look into my magic eight ball, you know, shake it up yeah. and be like, is Jarrett Stidham going to have a good year? I think like the little square would say like something like, seems probable. <laughs> Seems probable, most likely. Something like that. I, I don't know if that was actually one, but I was trying to remember from back in the day. <laughs> On the uh, talking about talking to guys in the locker room, this is the perfect example of Stidham could walk in and out of that locker room last year mostly unharmed because everyone was so Brady focused. And now this year, everyone, if we're in there or whatever the situation could be, is swarming him. So that's one of those situations where it's like now everyone needs something from Jared Stidham to get his perspective. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you about your uh, on social media. I love that even the guys and girls that hate on you in some respect on what you're tweeting, you still reply to all of them and you address them uh, by their screen name or their first name. Why is that something you've decided to do? You're funny, Yanni, that you see that. It'll um, be like Mr. Patriot fan six eight four five, and you're like, "Well, Mr. <laughs> Patriot fan six eight four five, thanks for the reply." Yes. yes. <laughs> I think it comes down to the whole thing that we're discussing here. Like just because we're behind our computer screens and we're not seeing each other face to face 
like it's a, a human dialogue that we're having together. And like, if I know, you know, like we can agree to disagree and look, sometimes I might be wrong, you know, and I'll, I'll acknowledge that I'm not going to be right all the time. And I think to me, like one of the best parts about Twitter is the actual dialogue that you can have with your followers. Like one of my favorite things in the off season, Yanni, is I'll post like a piece on Sunday mornings. Yep. And I usually try to devote an hour or two to just, you know, with, when it posts to just respond, you know, to people that respond to the post. And it's, um, it reminds me a little bit of one of my favorite times in uh, sports journalism, maybe like 2005, 2006, 2007, when online chats were right. like a little more prevalent. Yeah. Now social media has sort of replaced that, but you could almost build a little community you know, in an online chat where a lot of the people would come back each week and you got to know people, yeah. you know, over, over like consecutive years by their screen names and, you know, stuff like that. So that, that's why I like to do that. And I think, again, it's like, there's no need to, like, if I saw you like in the street and I disagreed with something you said, I'm not going to like come yeah. up and yell at you. I might say, you know, hey, explain to me what you meant by that. But that's not usually the way it comes across right. on Twitter. So let's try to transition and get to the point where we're actually treating this like a face-to-face -face dialogue. So if you're walking around New England because uh, you've covered the Patriots for so long, people probably recognize you, say hello. Um, but are you ever surprised by the platform you have being on ESPN? You may be across the country or on vacation somewhere and you're in a different state or on a road game and someone's like, hey, Mike Reese. And you're like, I'm in Kansas City. How do you know who I am? Like, has that ever happened where you're you're like sometimes like, wow, I forget if I'm on SportsCenter or Get Up, these people are seeing my face on their TV halfway across the country. Yanni, usually what they're saying is <laughs> I didn't realize he was that small. Like, whoa, how tall is he? Like. He looks like Jared from Subway, you know. Like that's usually that's usually what they're saying. No, it's the guy from um, from Seinfeld, Elaine's. No, Elaine's I, book. That 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 one I like, but that one dates us a little bit because that, that was going way a back. A lot of Seinfeld right? fans out there. Awesome. All right, I've taken up enough of your time. Um, I appreciate it, and hopefully, I'll be seeing you soon in whatever capacity we're covering the Patriots. Maybe it'll be on a Zoom call. It's always funny when when you pull up the big grid and everyone's like in their houses and everyone's just staring and it's just it's almost the opposite view as if how belichick is looking at us in the media room of everyone's just staring at him so anyway all right mike thanks so much i appreciate it awesome yanni always great talking with you